morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here. Uh, my name is Svetla Marinova. I'll be uh, the moderator of this awesome panel that we have prepared here. Um, and I work with AWS. Um, my, my role is around um, helping partners uh, go to market with us. And I specialize in capital markets partnerships and in particular with a very keen interest for alternative ESG data and financial data. So joining me today, I have three of our um, AWS partners here um, and uh, would love to get us started with some uh, introductions. Um, so I'll let the panelists here introduce themselves. Um, let's start with, uh, with Eddie from, from NASDAQ. Please uh, tell us a little bit about what you do, what brings you here today, what are we going to um, you know, delve in in terms of like, topics that you're going to cover, and um, yeah, just introduce your company, please. Hey everyone, uh, we're at NASDAQ. I'm sure everyone knows what NASDAQ is. Um, we acquired a, a company called Quandle uh, f a few years ago. Quandle is an alternative data marketplace, and so I work on, on that at NASDAQ, which is known as Datalink. We rebranded it, um, and I also work on the, the Data Fabric initiative, which is basically building a managed service for you know investment professionals and asset managers to outsource most of their data engineering, data um, warehousing, data analytics stack, and basically save, save themselves the headache of doing non-differentiated uh, analytical work, um, engine, data engineering work, and focus on insight generation, machine learning, and more IP. Um, my background, I mean, I, I started my career in, in Bloomberg uh, on, on uh, Wall Street, went to a quantitative trading desk, uh, joined Google after, did data engineering and data analysis, and then now here I am. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, moving on, N Nate, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you do and what brings you here and, and about the Manatee? Sure. Thanks, Svetla, and thanks to everyone for, for, uh, for tuning in today, um, on the holiday especially. Um, you know, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Amenity Analytics, and you know, I spent you know, the first 15 years of my career uh, on Wall Street, on the, on the buy side, uh, managing money. And uh, I built Amenity because uh, I saw a major change coming to the financial markets you know, in terms of the quantification of markets, uh, which we had seen over a number of years, but bringing that same type of rigor to, to text. And so we work with, with uh, a number of leading companies, seven of the top 10 investment banks, some of the biggest hedge funds and other asset managers, uh, helping them get information out of text to either augment their their investment strategies or to further different work or to further various workflow solutions. So imagine not having to go into the documents and extract all sorts of information that, that you'd need. We have very specific expertise uh, around ESG. So in a lot of ways, the non-financial issues that uh, ESG focuses on are, are a perfect match for, uh, for natural language processing because those issues are discussed in various types of text, earnings call transcripts, news, research reports, and they aren't captured in the, in the numbers that, that people have so, so readily. So uh, that's a little bit about us and looking forward to the discussion today. Awesome, last but not least, Anthony. Yeah, hi everyone, thanks for having us uh, today. Um, I'm Anthony Termini, Senior Vice President of Business Development uh, at Morningstar. Uh, I've been with Morningstar for uh, over 13 years amongst a variety of different roles, uh, but for about eight years, I've been really chasing all things fintech. And uh, so when you think about Morningstar, our core business is really empowering the uh, asset and wealth management space with all sorts of data research and technology. Um, so my, the unique category that I work in is really all things fintech. We formally call it alliances and redistributors, but we get to really see the fringes of investing, personal finance, trading technology, new tools for advisors. Uh, and I get to break apart all the bits and pieces of our global business and bring that to um, everything from emerging stage startups that are in stealth mode, seeking funding, uh, to uh, uh, the emerging brokerage space, all the way to the most prominent names in, in tech that are really building some amazing things in the investment space. Um, so I like to say I have the funnest job at Morningstar. Uh, it's, a, it's a great organization. So thanks for having us and look forward to uh, talking here. Awesome. Thank you guys for the intros. 
So um, jumping straight into my first question for, for my panelists here, uh, but I will preface this with a bit of an introduction and where this question is coming from. Um, so we've, we've just experienced two years of a, of a global pandemic uh, and, and also a, a war happening in uh, you know, a, a pretty strategic part of the world. Um, and I have to say, um, you know, these last two years, like other than being very strange from a personal life perspective, have, have also been quite accelerated, if you will, for the financial services and, and fintech industry. I personally have been working in this space for uh, you know, my entire career, and, and I have to say um, this is the most dramatic transformation I've seen when it comes to um, you know, digital innovation, you know, um, uh, new and emerging technologies becoming mainstream, um, alternative data going mainstream, uh, the rise of the uh, retail uh, and, and personal investor, if you will, like through um, you know, um, retail investing apps like Robinhood becoming very, very popular, uh, digital assets becoming popular as an investment um, vehicle, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and so um, as, a, as a very um, you know, selfish AWS employee, I can't help but credit cloud for you know, enabling all of this and, and uh, you know, allowing for this transformation to happen and to be democratized and accessible, um, you know, given our scale and, and our ability to, um, to really um, you know, bring the digital into every industry. But from your perspective, what has been the most dramatic shift that you have seen to your business and to how your customers are accessing data? What types of data are they looking to access? Um, and, and you know, what are some of the um, drivers of, um, of customer demand that are impacting you as a provider of services and, and products to them? Um, and I'll, I'll let you guys pick who wants to, to start first. Nate, you're smiling, so I feel sure, like Sure, I'll you. dive in. Um, so I think one of the things that the cloud has, has enabled is amazing advances in machine learning. Um, and specifically from our perspective in natural language understanding and natural language generation. And we're seeing clients embrace this, uh, you know, clients like, like, like Morningstar who are sitting on massive repositories of text and are generating massive repositories of text. Their businesses are on the cusp of a, of a massive change because all text over the next number of years, and it's a lot closer than you might think, is going to either be generated by machines or is, and is definitely going to be analyzed by machines. And that is going to change the finance industry uh, very profoundly. At its core, the business models of, of, of uh, whether it's data providers or news providers or research providers uh, are, are really going to, to shift as this new dynamic uh, and new capabilities emerge. Um, and it also has profound implications for the investment world. You know, being able to treat information in, when it's in text or when it's spoken with the same level of rigor that you do towards fundamental data, towards valuation and stock price movements, uh, represents a sea change. Really the ability to capture your view of the world, capture what's important to you. Warren Buffett says, as an example, that the best way to analyze a, a, a company or the most important factor is their ability to raise prices without hurting demand. Uh, but that's very difficult to measure in the numbers. But you can measure it in terms of how, they, how companies talk about their business, how they talk about their ability to raise prices. Uh, and being able to incorporate that very clearly into your investment theses just represents such a, an important change and it's happening today and it's, it's really exciting and I think that has accelerated in a material way over the course of the last two years. Awesome, Eddie, from your perspective? Yeah, um, Nathaniel, I'm having flashbacks to Target's earnings call where they talked about how you know they were kind of screwed with the logistics issues recently. Um, but in general, I would say the cloud has really enabled um, more funds to participate in large data investments. So typically, you know, a few years ago, four or five years ago, you'd see the same names, the same players, quantitative funds leading the game, uh, leading the quantum mental strategies. Now we're seeing a lot more smaller shops pop up. You don't have to manage your infrastructure anymore. It's much easier to basically do grid compute, large scale calculations, also set up your own data warehouse things like that. These are things that used to be managed in-house in like five, ten years ago. And so you're breaking down the barriers for all these other funds. Uh, also, um, more recently, the alternative data space, what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of trends happening. So 
Um, re recently, like the, the, the retail investment craze with uh, GameStop and things like that. Uh, one of the data sets that you know, we, we put out was like the UREF data set, which is tracking retail order flows. Uh, people got really excited about that, but the alt data space is very, very much like fads, right? These fads keep happening. There's like the ESG fad um, that seems to be, you know, like it's not really a fad, it's just evolving, right? Like it's not the same as it was two, three years ago, like the, in, in the context of ESG. And then finally for us, we're also onboarding a lot of our technology into the cloud. So, um, like we we announced a partnership with AWS to to create a a, a basically completely cloud based exchange, um, and we we've also put our largest data feed, which is NCDS, onto uh, onto the cloud as well. And uh, and our team is is very heavy user of Databricks and AWS, um, deploying you know notebooks doing large scale compute without needing an infrastructure team to really manage the whole process. So. Absolutely, and just like a comment on, on NCDS on cloud, this is, this is the feed that is empowering fintechs um, in order to um, you know, be able to provide like cheap and like cost effective, if you will, like access and, and scale to um, the retail investors. So just wanted to throw in here that we, we've actually worked together on, on a number of um, um, I guess uh, integrations of NCDS into um, you know uh, retail investing apps, and and that's somewhere where we're you know going to market together. So I, I can see that transformation happening. Um, last but not least, Anthony. Yeah, I would just add that the retail explosion over the last several years has been you know totally incredible for our business. Um, when you think about where how has this all happened, uh, you think about discount brokers leading to online brokers leading to passive robo managed portfolio solutions, uh, leading to now emerging brokerages, right? There's so many options to build an elegant portfolio with a slick app experience. Uh, and now we have this new wave, and I don't know if you've experienced this, but there's this digital uh, hedge fund. So it's essentially a small investment management team that wants to uh, unlock you know, a basket of stocks. And so uh, I think all of us as leaders in this room, we have a, a, real, a real duty to, uh, to ensure that these new investors, we're talking about hundreds of millions of accounts that are opening, uh, we have a duty to ensure that they you know, don't get burned, that they have a good experience, uh, that they're delivered rich insights that are uh, easy to understand and consume. So you know, that's what we've done with the Robin Hoods of the world is kind of make our research a little bit more bite-sized and easy to consume. Uh, that's been exciting for us. And I think you know, another uh, impact is um, you know, certainly the, the evolution so of the investor and how they are maybe a younger uh, investor and they're, 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 they understand how to interact with LinkedIn and Instagram, right? It curates information and insights and things that you want to look at. Well, why shouldn't your portfolio do the same? So they come with new expectations around what a portfolio looks like. And so Morningstar has coined the term uh, active personalization, which is really just direct indexing, but we'll be launching uh, some tools in that category to help advisors really unlock and uh, deconstruct an index and rip it apart into its pieces to, to build something that aligns with an investor's goals. Um, and then I think the last thing um, is that, you know, new hires at organizations uh, are coming on with new skill sets, right? Coding, development, Python skills. And so with AWS, we partnered with, um, with AWS to launch an analytics lab. And it's a part of our flagship research product, Morningstar Direct. Uh, where essentially you're combining a Jupyter Notebook with Morningstar data to really unlock lots of different deep, rich insights so that investors could kind of break apart Morningstar's methodology, build their own methodologies, um, and share it with teams. So that's been, that's been exciting and it's changes we've seen. Yeah, absolutely. That collaborative aspect of you know multiple um, you know um, employees like touching the same data, having the same golden source, like being able to you know manipulate it and and collaborate on their investment thesis, I think is really really valuable. Um, so um, speaking of data and and insights from alternative data, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little personal story here. Like back in the day, about like five six years ago, uh, around the time when I met Nate, actually, I worked as a uh, a data buyer. Uh, that was like one of the hats that I was wearing in this innovation lab at a um, at a pension fund. And I remember back then, um, you know, I, my job was basically to like find like 20 different alternative data sets and 
test them with, with our um, uh, portfolio teams. Uh, you know, some were interested in commodities data, others were interested in more, uh, you know, fixed income uh, oriented data. But the point was I had to basically contact 20 different um, alternative data firms and figure out how to work with them, how to get access to the data, where to place the data so that it's accessible to uh, this team of portfolio managers who were going to test it. And I remember being very, very overwhelmed by the task. We definitely did not have the right tools in place at the time to, um, to be able to scale something like that. And times have definitely changed, right? The tools are available, as, as we all touched on. Um, but it seems like the appetite for data is also kind of insatiable. Like, there's just never enough alternative data sets. Um, so from your perspective, where are you seeing the most um, interesting demand in that space? Like, what are, can you give me some examples of, uh, you know, data sets that customers are asking for? I mean, whether they're custom ones or whether you have to go out there and find them for them. Um, so, like, how are you seeing the demand for alternative data um, change over, over the last few years? Eddie? Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll touch on one that came up more recently that seems to be in high demand. It's, it's uh, crypto order books. So... Um, it's stuff that that the only way you have it is you've you were you began collecting it many years ago, and now you have like a treasure trove of historical order book data which people can do back testing on and things like that. Um, so we we made an investment in Amber Data, uh, which is a is, is a company that basically did just that. It's a pretty good idea. I, I wish I'd thought of it many years ago, but um, th essentially they just collect order book data from all the all the different exchanges and, and depth as well and offer it as different products. Um, obviously the retail order flow data that we talked about earlier is interesting. Um, another thing that we're seeing is, is people having more interest in the commodities uh, lo logistical process. So looking at like ports and density of ships and ports. Um, I don't know if you heard recently, but, but we got cut off from this data, but um, ch the Chinese trucking data. So, so data and, and like looking at Chinese highways to see if the trucks are there and to see if like the, um, the, the, the cities have opened up yet, basically. Um, but yeah, those are the themes that we've, we've been seeing. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Nate? So, you know, I think that uh, one of the most important trends we've seen is that alt data has, has, has become a key component in investors' mosaic that they put together to, to try and drive their ability to, to predict where earnings are gonna come out. You know, when I started in the business you know, 20 years ago, uh, we were flying all over the world, talking to people, trying to get an, a, an understanding of where orders were gonna come out. And, and today, you're able to pull data points like geolocation data. You're able to pull data points like, like credit card receipts uh, to really get a good understanding of where a number might be coming out before it actually comes out. And that trend has really driven alt data to the, to the forefront. You know, when you're able to explain a stock price movement based on the release of, of, a, of a data point like that, uh, you know, it becomes mainstream. Everyone wants to, to get that data. Uh, for us, you know, we're more on the forefront uh, of helping customers scale human intuition, help them scale their insights by being able to to, to take something like um, like sentiment across earnings calls and be able to measure all the companies in an, er in a, in an industry and find an outlier. Uh, we help use uh, different techniques to understand uh, when a company might be uh, on roller skates versus the analyst community. We call it deception, but what it really does is, is measure when a management team either can't or won't answer the questions uh, that the analysts are asking them. Uh, and being able to, to create those types of data sets uh, that can let an investor find something that they might miss. Maybe they have three earnings calls on at that same point in time and can't listen as, acu as acutely as they'd like to. Uh, and we help them flag those outliers so that they know when they, they should take a deeper dive. And you know, for more quantitative clients, you know, there is a statif there is a uh, a verifiable source of alpha in these types of data sets. 
Awesome. And I, I do remember actually, even like during uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, you started tracking like COVID sentiment as well. So you've been quite responsive to, you know, events that are happening, uh, you know, in the world. Like, can, can you just give us a couple more examples? I know you have them. Oh, yeah. Um, well, inflation for us is a is a, you know, is a is a real bonanza because, you know, I mentioned pricing power before. Well, inflation is great for a company that has has pricing power. Take uh, take Mercedes-Benz as an example. They're able to raise prices in advance of uh, of uh, the inflationary pressure that they're that they're seeing. So it's actually leading to margin expansion in the, in that case. And what we're able to do is identify those companies that are talking most positively about pricing power, and conversely, identify those that are talking most negatively about about margins or about uh, or about about pricing pressure themselves. And then you can do that to create indices, you can create uh, all sorts of, of rankings of stocks, either to dig deeper or to create trading strategies around those, and those have shown to be very profitable. So you know, when an issue comes up, if you, if, you, if you think about how would I want to capture it, how would I want to capture the companies that are, that are talking most uh, aggressively around competition uh, in these times? We can help you create those types of, of screens or even index, index uh, type of selection mechanisms in order to capture those those companies. Awesome. So anybody who may care about inflation, go and talk to Nate after <laughs> after the panel. Um, Anthony, from your perspective. Yeah. So uh, several several years ago, Morningstar acquired PitchBook, right? And PitchBook's been in an incredible business and growing really fast. So with with their lens on the market, right, we can cover uh, a company from seed round funding through all the fundraising series. Uh, through IPO, and then with Morningstar, you're covering them from a public equity side. So, you know, Mor Morningstar, you know, data is at the foundation of everything that we do. Uh, we have lots of alternative data sets. Uh, even when you think about our um, managed investment database, right, which is how Morningstar started, right, providing transparency on mutual funds where there wasn't really any uh, light being shined. Um, and, and that's how we got started. Even that database today is still growing at 11% clip year over year. So we're talking about 11% for the next five years. Um, and we're looking at somewhere between um, the next three and five years, we'll have uh, roughly a million different products uh, for an investor and advisor to build a portfolio from. So that's just so much data. Uh, a lot of that is alternative data sets. Uh, but we're not just thinking about alternative data. We're also thinking about alternative services. Uh, so from an advisor's perspective, and Morningstar reaches 180,000 advisors across the U.S. and Canada. Um, you know, how do we build uh, services around their core business? Uh, so maybe their family office. Of course, they maybe interact with Morningstar for research and proposal generation, and client communication, building portfolios. But what else can we do to help them kind of further that along? Uh, so we've partnered with Luma Technologies. They're a structured products data provider so that an, invest, an advisor can build a portfolio around structured products, make proposals, see how those interact with their uh, existing models. Uh, we've also built connections to uh, mortgages, so mor mortgage origination, lending, refinancing. These are skills that will be brought to the advisor. And then we'll be announcing some partnerships in the crypto TAMP space uh, so that an advisor or family office can allocate into uh, in crypto. Awesome. So it, it seems like there will be more and more alternative data um, and, and alternative, um, I guess, delivery mechanisms of data, um, you know, coming up. Um, and, and, you know, it just makes me realize that, um, you know, um, maybe an Excel spreadsheet is not going to be very helpful here, right? So let's, let's kind of turn our, um, our eyes to, like, big data sourcing and, and scaling mechanisms. Um, Eddie, would you like to kind of get us started on, you know, how, how is data sourced, that, you know, how is it delivered to customers, what do they need in order to be able to access it and, and in order to make sense of it? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so it, it really starts at the very beginning when you're sourcing the data and you're doing your modeling and, and things like that. Like one of the biggest pain points that we've seen with investment management firms and, and even just large enterprises in general is when they're sourcing alternative data, they, they now have all these different teams and different data silos, we call them, looking at the data sets. They're all modeling the data. They're all defining their own fields. I don't know if you've experienced this, but like, you know, two, two different teams will have their own definition of the same field, right? So there's no like really golden copy of the data anymore. 
Um, so the flexibility of the cloud is pretty much a double-edged sword in, in many ways. If you, if you don't have the right processing, processes in place, you'll essentially end up with data sprawl. Um, you'll, you'll have uh, trouble managing all the different data pipelines if you're dealing with you know, millions of alternative data sets, right? Like you, you're gonna have basically a nightmare to operate over. Um, you have, you're gonna, you have to make sure that all the data is like uh, recent and fresh. Um, and you, 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 you get into this scenario where um, there's a convergence of talent. So previously, in order to do data pipelines, and you would need someone who was just like a Python engineer or a software engineer, right? These days, you can actually, there are tools that enable you know, a data analyst with just SQL, SQL skills to be able to model data, set up their own ETL pipelines, things like that. And so there, there's sort of this push to move up the stack to enable a domain expert with business knowledge to do their own ETL, to do their own like data management and things like that without needing this sort of back and forth telephone game where they submit a request to a software engineering team, software engineering team puts in a ticket, you know, in Jira puts it in the queue and then so on and so forth. So there, there's, there's, a, there's a huge convergence into managed services. Managed services are really allowing, you know, an analyst with a financial services background to do analysis, to do things that they weren't able to do before. Um. Awesome, and, and I know we'll touch on, you know, how teams are structured as well and how that has changed, so stay tuned for that part. But um, wanted to um, ask the same question to Anthony, actually. Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, pulling, pulling the, uh, the technologies that used to reside kind of behind the scenes in the operations layer of, of data, bringing them forward uh, into a user experience that, like, like you were saying, someone with Python or development skills can kind of put that to work. Uh, that's been maybe most beneficial for us, um, especially with our analytics lab uh, product that we just launched. Um, I, I would say also, you know, how we've used, uh, say, machine learning and, um, natural language generation is really to augment and extend the work that our analysts do, right? So as a human analyst, you can only cover so many sectors and so many stocks, right? So it's pretty natural that you'd use machine learning and natural language generation to kind of augment and extend their coverage. And that's what we've done. We've had that in play for maybe uh, almost 10 years now. And, uh, and that's been really successful so that an investor could look at a human covered stock and see what Morningstar would think, but also look at a you know a small cap micro cap company to see if you were to run it through the same models what would it look like uh, if an analyst a human analyst covered it so that's been helpful for us to kind of bring forward the tools that kind of resided behind the scenes and more front and center yeah absolutely and I mean speaking of AI ML um, amenity maybe um, a, a bit of a, a glimpse into that and and how it um, you know helps scale sure so I think you know we're seeing a lot of pressure at our clients to, to do more with less, uh, especially on the sell side, uh, where there is you know, still the, the pull, like Anthony mentioned, to cover more companies and do it with less people. And that's driving a lot of demand for, for automation, you know, which, is, which is where we come in. You know, there are certain use cases, you know, one actually we work with, with NASDAQ on, where we monitor uh, all of the SEC filings that are issued by NASDAQ listed companies to try and identify when those companies have disclosed something that's in violation of the NASDAQ listing requirements. And this was a task that was previously done by simply hitting control F through tens of thousands of documents every year, looking for one of 50 things that might be disclosed in any one of those documents. Um, and we've been able to, to automate that. We've been able to deliver them that, th those data points at human levels of accuracy, in some cases above human levels of accuracy, so that they can put their analysts on higher value tasks. They can spend their time reviewing the violations instead of trying to find them. And it's increased efficiency uh, in a in a tremendous way. And so we're seeing a lot of our clients try and identify those tasks that can be automated and that they can use, you know, then that data uh, in order to drive a business process or a workflow that's just more efficient and more effective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think your value in, you know, um, 
basically removing technical barriers to uh, productivity and to like insights is uh, is something that you know I, I personally based my career off of and 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 I'm really glad to see you know solutions like these like really helping you know portfolio managers become more effective and also more consistent in in their work but speaking of portfolio managers wanted to um, to touch on how um, how teams have changed their structure. And whether this is like due to the pandemic, whether this is through, um, you know, due to the natural progression of technology becoming more available. Um, Eddie, I, I know you have an opinion on, on this one. Yeah, yeah, so so tip, like a lot of the funds that we're dealing with will have a, a pod model where, you know, you know, individual PMs will manage their own books. Um, some will rely on a central IT team what we're seeing is this kind of proliferation of, of these individual teams being able to take into, take into their own hands their own, um, their own tech stack, essentially, which, which they consider as part of their IP as well. Um, another thing that's really interesting here is um, data utilization. So these, these individual teams, they, they want to know like, what data uh, is being used by each of the different teams so they can do accounting as well. So, the central IT team will essentially do um, some sort of accounting and track the, the API usage and the data usage among each of the teams to see which uh, portfolio managers are required to pay for certain data sets as well. So we're, we're kind of seeing this distributed management of all the different PM teams, uh, but also this enabling of the different PM teams as well and allowing PM teams to function without requiring you know, a software engineer, infrastructure engineer, cloud engineer to help them do their job. So that, that, that's really what we're seeing. Awesome. Um, if anybody else wants to opine, please go for it. Well, I, I would say that the, the role of a, of a data, data leader uh, in a traditional hedge fund, especially in the, the long short or event space, has become uh, the price of admission. Uh, and I, a lot of cases, you know, data is only as good as you can make sense of it. And, you know, as we've seen this proliferation of new data sources, of new ways of, of looking at companies, a lot of analysts and portfolio managers have been left behind. They simply have their way of doing business. It's worked for them over time, increasingly less well, but it has worked, and they don't want to change it. And how are they used to consuming information? having someone put it on a silver platter for them. And honestly, that's what's most efficient. And so that role is now being filled by, by these data teams. And the most effective ones develop the methodologies that they can take their, those insights to those analysts, to those portfolio managers in as simple a way as possible so that they can understand what new information might be impacting their, their names and their portfolios. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, also touching on ESG data. I know we mentioned it earlier and this is my bread and butter and, and something that I'm very excited about. Um, personal moment again, I actually studied climate science like more than 10 years ago in grad school and I really wanted to work in sustainable investing. Like that was my you know dream job. and. I, I remember trying to find a job where you know I could be like a portfolio manager at, at a sustainable investing company, and there just weren't that many jobs back then um, that uh, you know that were available to somebody who just finished grad school. Um, and times have really changed now. I mean, we see like a, an actual um, you know transformation, if you will, in the investment mandates of, of so many you know investment managers. Um, it, it seems like ESG data all of a sudden and ESG investing has gone mainstream. And I wanted to delve into, A, the drivers of that, like where do you think this is, is coming from, uh, you know, as a, um, as a um, I guess, like increased focus that we're seeing around ESG. And also, what, it, what, is, what are your thoughts on where the industry is going? Like, how is this going to, um, you know, change over time? I know uh, both, both Morningstar and Amenity touch on, on ESG data quite heavily. Um, so uh, please uh, let me know what, what your thoughts are, where, you know, how come there are sustainable investing jobs now and there weren't before? Is it, does it have something to do with the availability of data or wildfires? Like where, where is it coming from? Nate, maybe you first? Sure, so you know, first off, the world has changed. And you know, to me, that's where it starts. The priorities of, of people generally have shifted where they want the capital that, that they invest to have a purpose beyond just making more money. And that's led to 
an enormous amount of money, trillions of dollars, depending on who you ask. You know, I've seen numbers as high as $50 trillion of assets have some sort of sustainable investing tag on them. And that has kicked off uh, a virtuous and self-reinforcing cycle uh, that has driven ESG really to the forefront of, of all of our minds. Uh, you know, in that when, when, when you have that money, that amount of money that's looking for a home, you know, in you know, CEOs see that that money, they want to attract it. How can they get? How can they use that to drive their their share price? So they enact uh, more ESG friendly initiatives. You know, in some cases, transform their their businesses to uh, to be able to attract that money because that's where they can get the money to invest. Investors see that happening and they want to reward those companies. It drives higher multiples. Uh, and that cycle just keeps repeating. That drives investment performance of, of ESG funds. And we've seen ESG funds outperform over the last number of years. So that whole cycle is now, uh, is now fully upon us. And you know, it's created a lot of interesting dynamics. You know, for us as a, a data company, how do we capture those non-financial issues and deliver that information, that research, so that investors can make those those decisions? You know, we've seen uh, companies like 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 Morningstar's division, Sustainalytics, come out and try and make those decisions uh, for investors. Tell them which are the companies that that are sustainable, which are the ones that are that are not, which are the ones on the come, and which ones should be doing doing more. Uh, but what we've seen lately. Is that companies is that investors want to make those decisions themselves? Uh, they want to be able to to take that data, that that core building blocks of a company's ESG strategy, especially when it comes to the E, the sustainability side of of uh, the investment, and and understand what are those what are those key key drivers that make a company environmentally friendly, even a company that might be a big polluter but is making moves now. To, so that they're a less big polluter. That is a company that, that we see uh, a lot of our clients say, how do we systematically target those companies that, that might be uh, ripe for a, for a big change or, or how can we get in front of sustainalytics analysis of that company being ES, now ESG friendly. So um, again, uh, it's all started with, 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 with capital, you know, with, with people deciding we want to deploy capital into the issues that we care most about. And that is really, in, in my view, what's led to this whole uh, you know, ES, ESG framework that we're seeing put on, uh, you know, put in front of all of us as investors and start to really be one of the dominant themes in the marketplace. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting, you know, the the comparison here, right? What what we find actually is AWS talking to a number of capital markets customers who are interested in integrating ESG data is that they consume anywhere between, like, if they're early on their journey, they will cons they will consume like maybe two three different data sets, like Sustainalytics usually being one of the one of the top ones that they request, and then as they mature on their you know ESG data integration journey, they end up consuming like up to 40 different ESG data sets because they are looking to customize, they are looking for that secret ESG sauce, if you will. Um, but le let's hear from, from a Sustainalytics representative. I mean, you guys were at the forefront of this many, many years ago. Yeah, we started working with Sustainalytics uh, six or seven years ago, and they have such rich company-level information, and we found it to be a perfect match for Morningstar because we could take their company-level data and marry it with our rich holdings information on funds and ETFs to derive fund-level scores. Uh, but just taking a step back, I think it's all about education uh, as far as ESG goes. And um, you think about the way we... Person, way, way I personally look at ESG is I think it's another lens on the market, right? So we have, as an independent investment research provider, we have lots of different lenses that we offer and perspectives, right? Uh, so whether it's fundamental, whether it's technical or quantumental, whether it's holdings-based style analysis or returns-based style analysis, we offer lots of different lenses. And one of the things that we've uh, launched with uh, Sustainalytics is a sustainability framework. Uh, so it's a spectrum of 
uh, approaches to how to invest in ESG or, or kind of dabble in the spectrum of ESG. And we, the spectrum ranges from avoiding negative outcomes to advancing positive outcomes. And so if you work through the six approaches, if I can remember those, uh, the first one being excluding uh, industries or companies that you just don't want to be a part of, uh, that maybe don't align with the behaviors that you would expect. Uh, the second one is about limiting uh, certain um, risks, right? So you're typically looking at derived risk scores or um, unmanageable kind of uh, behaviors or uh, traits that a company or industry might be exposed to. Uh, the third approach is really about positive screening, right? So it's choosing the best of the best. If it doesn't meet your criteria, you're only going to move forward with this basket of stocks. Um, in the uh, the fourth is uh, related to proxy voting, right? So pushing forward an agenda or pushing forward behaviors um, and approaches that way through uh, voting. Uh, the fifth is related to thematics. So we track so many different themes across the investing landscape. So whether it's clean energy or renewable, something like that, you're aligning with that approach. Um, and then the sixth is really impact. So that's kind of the most kind of uh, advancing of the positive outcome spectrum is you're really investing for, for purpose and you're typically aligning with the UN uh, sustainable development goals. Awesome. Um, love, love the ESG team. Always up for talking about that. Um, I want to uh, spend our last uh, few minutes, um, you know, um, talking through what do what do we think are our wildest and and take this with a grain of salt. Like you can be as wild as you want. Uh, what are, what would be your wildest predictions in terms of where uh, data, alternative data, is going over the next like say three to five years? whether it's in terms of delivery mechanisms, whether it's in terms of like new data sets becoming available, uh, whether it's around like ESG data granularity or crypto data, uh, please uh, just uh, opine here and, and, and tell us what we should be you know, excited about in terms of uh, alternative assets and, and the data that uh, helps us evaluate them. Eddie? Yeah, I guess it's more maybe uh a, con a contradiction that I, that I feel like is, is arising. So alternative data used to be hard to source, right? It used to be more difficult to find, and that's why it's alternative data. That's why it gives you alpha. That's why it gives you an edge. I feel like, you know, like all these marketplaces are coming up. People are acquiring, you know, smaller data providers and companies, vending them out, and it's becoming a lot easier to... Uh, to acquire. So I, I think like the alpha that you get from just acquiring all data uh, is probably decreasing over time. What, whereas like the, the value of the insights that you can generate from the data um, is really like where the bread and butter is, right? So, you know, machine learning models that you can apply on, on different data sets, things like that. Um, but even then, like models will converge too, right? So like alpha is like ever decreasing in this space. Um, so I just find it like pretty interesting that with the growth of all data, with the democratization of all data, the, the alpha of all data also goes down, you know, ever so slightly, incrementally, in perpetuity. I don't know, that's my theory, but... <laughs> One thing to make this a little bit more positive, right? Um, I, maybe we should, like, turn our attention to different asset classes, right? Like different, uh, you know, um, like, for example, uh, crypto or, like, digital assets. And, and I think there will be an opportunity for alternative data to emerge there and for it to, like, not really squeeze out the alpha so much so quickly. But, I mean, given the speed at which um, alternative data becomes mainstream, I don't know, like, m maybe we have a couple of years to go on that one, right? Yeah. Awesome. Um, Nate? So I tipped my, tipped my hand earlier, um, but I'm going to double down. You know, I see the biggest change uh, in, in markets coming from the ability of machines to both generate and understand text uh, at at human levels uh, having profound impact on the market. You know, from the the generation standpoint, uh, you know, being able to understand what's what matters, what's real, what might be disinformation uh, is going to be critical. And from the understanding point of view. Uh, it creates endless possibilities to capture your ideas, to capture your view of the world, and to transform those into investable strategies. And to do that in a systematic way that includes vast amounts of information that today is ignored. And that is coming, and it's coming sooner than many might think. So I think 
you know, as we talk about, you know, the data sets that are out there, the ability to be able to incorporate these new ways of looking at the world that are specific to, 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 to your investment strategy, you know, capturing, again, how you view the world, what drives stock prices, uh, is going to have a profound impact on, on markets and, and how we all invest. Yeah, and I mean, I think the beauty here is that this type of framework can, and, and, you know, technology stack can really be applied to any problem, right? It, it's about, like, where, where does an, an asset manager or, or a hedge fund see the value? Like, what is, what is it that they're looking for in the data? So the, the scalability aspect of it comes into play again. That's right. It's infinitely scalable. So once you get your core infrastructure in place, you really can exploit it in so many different ways. Awesome. Anthony? Yeah, just, I would say, um, you know, just like science or medicine is a process, right? It's, it's ongoing and ever-changing, so is technology, right? So as you change the inputs and the technology is available, the, the output uh, continues to evolve and change. So that's the most exciting thing about being in fintech and innovation, right, is to see the ever-going change. Um, one of the things that's interesting, though, is the convergence that we're seeing going on, taking place from... Uh, emerging brokerages wanting to be banks and neobanks wanting to offer traditional payment services and credit cards. And then you have credit unions that want to do all the above. And then you have crypto wanting to get into traditional equities, right? So the convergence is pretty interesting. And I see, I think the data coming out of that space, it will, you know, demand new data sets and the use cases will demand new data sets. So that's fascinating. I would say, um, you know, coming out of the Bitcoin conference in Miami, that was, uh, Pretty amazing to see the kind of enterprise level uh, of infrastructure that's out there and the integration opportunities amongst these platforms. And you, when you think about the fundamental data sets that are available at the equity level, like why don't those exist at the crypto level? So there's there's a lot of learning to be done across both TradFi and DeFi worlds, and I'm excited to see how it unfolds. Likewise, thank you guys so much for sharing your, your thoughts with us today. Um, if, if anybody is interested in alternative data, you know exactly who to reach out to. So uh, thanks so much and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll chat with you.